climate issues have been exacerbated the last few years. We've had hotter and drier summers. The urban landscape is a significant consumer of local and regional and even global water budget and water resources. We're going to be looking for death. We want to see that threshold where the plants really can't make it. I'm pretty aspirational. The end product that we're looking for is really to improve the urban dwellers' environment. So this project started studying how plants respond to different irrigation treatments in different locations and, uh, and climates. The overall objective is water conservation in landscapes, uh, and that, that is the purpose. But the, in addition to water conservation, we want to still be able to have landscapes that are purposeful, that are not just aesthetic. With climate changing or climate change, water in many parts, including our states, will likely to become more uh, scarce, scarcer resource than ever in our region. So there will be increased competition and demand for the limited amount of water from all different sectors, including agricultural sector. So finding science-based ways to reduce water use by landscape plants through selecting and planting water, water-wise plants is, is very important for um, saving precious water resource. We know that landscapes provide other services like environmental support, uh, social impacts, um, and economic impacts as well. So we want to have the whole package. We want to have all those benefits, but with uh, low water use. I've had some questions from people that have heard about the Climate Ready Landscape Plants Project. You know, what makes this different in trialing water use in uh, landscape plant resilience and uh, potential drought tolerance. And, and it, the, really the difference is we're very systematically measuring uh, water uptake and doing a uh, really controlled design. So it's not just anecdotal, we'll actually have the data to back it up. We started this project in 2004. In 2017, we expanded the study sites to include the UC Agricultural and Natural Resources South Coast Research and Extension Center in Irvine. Uh, so we completely duplicated our fields in the Southern California location. Last year in 2020, we received funding from, from the USDA Specialty Crops Multi-State Program that enabled us to further expand the, the research sites to University of Washington, Oregon State University, Utah State University, and the University of Arizona. Uh, so what we do is we install landscape plants in the ground, uh, for a full year and then uh, expose them to irrigation treatments during the second year. Uh, then we collect data that enables us to develop recommendations to how to irrigate these plants. The new landscapes that are installed in California that require a permit, which can also include renovations of landscapes of a certain size, have to meet this water budget requirement. And in order to do that, they have to know how much water the plants that are going to be planted in there actually use. And the way they do that is by looking up in this online database called the Water Use Classification of Landscapes. And in it, it lists whether or not plants are categorized as low, moderate, or high water users, or very low water users. And that falls into a range of water use that's defined by reference evapotranspiration. A lot of plants that people assume are low water use or high water use may not in fact turn out to be that way. So if they're established well and they're watered according to the method where you actually allow the water to be to be used up and then you add it again to fill that water reservoir, a lot of plants that you might otherwise think of as high water users may turn out to be low. And what's really neat about this project is it's really scientifically controlled as part of the research study. So the randomized block design, everything's very specific in terms of the irrigation controls and how things are spaced and set up and prepared. The experimental design is identical in each of the locations. So that enables us to uh, compare results uh, across all the different locations. And we can study how plants perform with different irrigation levels in the different climates. There are a number of um, 
plant ecologists and physiological ecologists on the team. And so we're, we're able to um, bring some of the tools that we use, whether that's a device called a leaf perometer that can actually measure the transpiration, so the water leaving the plant's leaves, or a portable photosynthesis system, which can measure how much carbon dioxide is being assimilated into the leaves. And so we have these tools that we'll use. So we're replicating the exact same planting across all these different sites, right? And so at each of our sites, we'll take our tools and our skills and our perspectives, and we'll look at how the plants are growing, seeing how quickly they grow, how large they grow, um, how much water they're using, and then we'll compare that between the different sites to identify which plants are doing better um, in which environments. Plant Selection Visits Project was really interesting because we wanted to try things that weren't only new or more recently developed, but some of the old stalwarts in the landscape, even plants that we maybe don't think of as water-wise or especially um, indicative of drier environments, for instance. My favorite example was in our first list, which was on the Arboretum All-Stars list, is a California native called Carex spissa, or San Diego sedge. And in nature, it grows, as most sedges do, near the edges of rivers in Southern California. And so you would assume this would be a high water user. And in fact, in the old days, many, many years ago, Sunset listed this as a high water use plant because nature would tell you it would but it's also a california plant and so a lot of our plants are adapted to both inundation during the wet season as well as drought during the dry season and when we evaluated this it in fact turned out to be quite a great low water use plant so irrigated according to our methods it really could be used as a low water plant water it in the you know get, gets the natural water in the winter but then in the summer it is perfectly adapted we want to see how plants that have been used in landscapes for so long here and have persisted in some way or another, you know, what are their tolerances as the climate changes? So we really had to work to find plants that were somewhat available for testing and especially were available across all the sites in some cases. So some of these plants are available or being used at all six sites and then some we actually are working more with our region. It's, it's a really nice way to kind of have a, have a nerdy discussion about plants uh, and, and bring up some questions we may have had by observing them growing over many years. After we had gone through all the Arboretum All-Stars that we could feasibly evaluate in this two-year trial, we decided that we needed to make this more accessible to the nursery industry. And that's when we began to ask them if they had plants that they wanted to introduce into the trade in California, but for which there was no water use classification available because that would in fact be a barrier to those plants being specified in a landscape plan if you didn't have that particular piece of data. And so they began to see the value in having that little bit of data so that they could have their plants listed in Google's. And that's the way the plant selection process has been going now since then. We actually try to emphasize to the various cooperators, and we've worked with over 25 different growers, both within the state, nationally, and even internationally, to try to get them to you know, introduce more climate appropriate plants for the state of California. One of the strengths of this project really is our, our linkage and our club par partnership with the industry. Um, so. What we can do, well, we have a number of stakeholders who sit on our board and advise us. Um, so in our calls, when we're selecting plants, we're working with growers, uh, landscapers, um, people who will be breeding and selecting and providing the plants, but then also people who will be using them in landscapes. And if we can get everybody on the same page, moving towards sustainable plant selections that are regionally appropriate, those that are regionally appropriate in Washington are not the same as those that are appropriate in San Bernardino. So that's, I think, one of the best aspects of this project is that we are making those growers start to think about that. The nursery thinking about, all right, this is now on everybody's radar, that things are changing and we need to be smart about the plants that we're growing and where we market them and how we market them. I'd like to see um, from this project that 
we would be able to um, put together a, a solid and robust knowledge base and, and database that can inform uh, horticultural industry, landscape ar architecture industry, um, irrigation specialists and the public about selecting water wise plants, making irrigation recommendations and other help, helpful uh, information for water conservation in sustainable urban landscapes or sustainable landscapes. I would in uh, personally, I would I would also like to see that the project will grow uh, to encompass not only the water um, aspect, but other valuable services and functions that those landscape plants can provide. So to people and to an ecosystem, urban ecosystem as a whole.